Thank you very much. Um, 35 years in the medical device, uh, pharmaceutical industry, meaning FDA regulated. Part of the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 820, talk about uh, medical devices. Uh, 820.250 says that you shall have procedures for identifying valid statistical techniques. Uh, it also says you'll have procedures for selecting sampling plans to ensure that they're adequate for their intended use. We're audited against those uh, regulations, and so one of the few industries where you can get us a ticket for doing bad statistics. Now, one of those things about writing those procedures for uh, statistics, uh, I want to talk about the one now uh, for test method validation. As you're writing a procedure, you can't turn around and write a procedure that covers half the cases that you might encounter. When you write a procedure, you have to be able to cover the full range of cases. Now, it might be okay to have a, a branch out there that says consult a statistician in these special or unusual cases, but that can't occur 50% of the time or it doesn't work. So I want to talk about the procedure for validating a test method. You're probably largely familiar with the primary tool for validating a test method, a gauge R&R study. But there's limitations of a gauge R&R study. One of them, it doesn't work when the test is destructive. Uh, so what do you do in that branch? What about if the underlying inspection is a pass-fail inspection? Again, you can't use a gauge R&R study. And so from that point of view, I want to talk about the procedure for validating a test method as opposed to the tools for validating a test method. How do we put it all together? How do we justify what we're doing? Now, uh, wouldn't it be nice if you were doing a job, if you had this well-written procedure that told you exactly what to do in each case and how to do it, you know, how to do it and so on? Uh, hard procedure to write, for sure. But with that type of tool, engineers can consistently perform, perform a test method validation uh, for that. So when in our industry is a test method validation required? A test method validation is used, uh, required before you can use an instrument for production purposes, control, releasing product. In our terminology, we call that production controls. We also require a test method validation before we can use a uh, test method to demonstrate that a process consistently produces good quality product. We refer to that as process validation. We require to have a validated test method before we can use a test instrument to demonstrate that a product design works. We call that design verification. For all of those things, you need to have a piece of paper that says process validation report, valid pro the, uh, or the sorry, test method validation report, test method has been validated, and it needs to be dated and signed prior to being used in your other documents. Uh, so you can't validate it after the purpose or, or incident there. So I want to talk about uh, kind of the process for validating a test method. And so a little bit of terminology here. There's really three things that we're interested in as we're validating a test method. Two of them have to do with precision. And basically with precision, do we get the same answer? We're interested in repeatability and reproducibility. And then the other thing we're looking at is bias. So I'll just explain these in a little more detail. Bias or accuracy is basically answer the question, are we getting the right answer? On the average, are we centered over around the true value or the reference value? Repeatability has to do, do we get the same answer? Not necessarily the right answer, but if we measure the same part over and over again, uh, do we get the same part or the same answer under same person, same instrument, you know, same period of time? So keeping as many things as possible the same, do we get the same answer? And then as we mix some of those things up, have a different operator repeat the measurements, do it on a different gauge, do it tomorrow, do we still get the same answer? So it's, again, it's precision, but do we get the same answer? Reproducibility. Now, a lot of times when you read about gauge R&R studies, they talk about reproducibility with respect to operators. So we have several different operators do the measurements. But what if you have an instrument that all the operator does is push a button? and starts up and, and does it, then maybe the reproducibility should be with respect to days, uh, assays. It's the calibration that's important, so repeat, re, 
uh, producibility with respect to calibration curves. We want to recalibrate on three different days and maybe have three different operators do it at the same time. Uh, so reproducibility with whatever makes the most sense uh, for your measurement device. Uh, now, in our regulations, it says we have to validate the, the process or product for its intended use. And so I want to talk about not all measurements are used for the same thing in a manufacturing environment. So what are they used for? Sometimes they're used as part of attribute or variable sampling plans. So we're making a pass-fail decision on either lots of product or it could be part of design verification and process validation. Does, is the design good, pass or fail? Is the process good, pass or fail, before we go into production? We might also do it for full verifications or 100% inspections where we're looking at each unit and measuring it and decide which ones go in the scrap and which ones we can release. We might also be using it part of production controls and control charting to decide when to adjust the process or take action on the process. We also might use the method uh, instrument for statistical studies such as a regression, a NOVA, designed experiment, which material was stronger, uh, which of the, uh, how, how does temperature affect the seal strength of a machine. And so all of those things, we, we could use a, a tensile tester in uh, doing tests as part of a designed experiment. So I want to start with these intended uses and to talk about what's important in the content of each one of these uses. And we're going to start with a variable sampling plan. A variable sampling plan is something like take 30 samples and accept that the PPK is greater than 1.1. Or take 30 samples or 10 samples and accept that the average is at least two standard deviations away from the specification limits. Different way we can, can write the acceptance criteria, but it's based on the average and the standard deviation of the data. Now, things that can lead to false acceptances. Now, there's two th errors obviously we can make. One is we can falsely accept something. Another thing is we can falsely reject good product. From a regulatory point of view, the FDA doesn't worry about that second one. If we falsely reject good product, that's a business concern. But falsely releasing bad product is the thing that we really focus on in justifying and validating our test instrument. Now bias, if we're measuring getting the wrong value, that can cause us to release product that should be uh, failed. Reproducibility, let's say with respect to operators. If the operators are different, we may be running one day and accepting everything. Now we go to second shift and the operator's measuring everything a little bit different. And so they reject some stuff and uh, maybe in the morning we've uh, passed some stuff that didn't deserve. The other operator would have rejected it. And so reproducibility can also lead to false acceptance. Now repeatability, that uh, short-term measurement variation, cannot lead to false acceptances. Uh, and I just want to show here a picture of what's called the operating characteristic or OC curve of this variable plan. It's 32 samples and except if the standard deviation is at least 2.13 standard deviations away, or the average is at least 2.13 standard deviations away from the average, uh, the spec limit. And so the OC curve, the dark one here, tells you what the probability of acceptance is for different defect rates when there's no measurement variation. And that's the theoretical curve you see in textbooks and uh, standards all the time, it assumes no measurement variation. What happens if there is measurement variation? It makes it more likely you're going to fail the sampling plan. So we can see at 5% defective, if 25% of our variation is due to measurement, then it decreases the chances of passing a little bit. And if it's 50% is measurement variation, it cuts down the chances of passing. So from a customer point of view, and an FDA point of view, the protection improves. We're more likely to reject bad lots if we have more measurement variation. And so there's no problem with proceeding and using a method that fails the repeatability requirement uh, for the purposes of a sampling plan. It protects our customer against bad product. Now, there is a business decision we have to make as to whether we could end up falsely rejecting uh, good product and the cost of improving the gauge versus the rejection, false rejection rate. Uh, and maybe we're way down here close to zero defects, and so we're going to release everything anyways. And so we can live with some measurement variation repeatability, not reproducibility, not bias. The same thing is true of an attribute gauge where there's an underlying measurement. And what do I mean by with an underlying measurement? Well, a missing part 
There is no underlying measurement. It's there or it's not. But a drop test where you drop it on the floor and it breaks, and there's always a seal that breaks, well, now seal strength would be the underlying measurement that would indicate uh, whether the drop test might pass or fail. So when you have an underlying measurement like that, then th just like with a variable sampling plan, bias and reproducibility can lead to false acceptances. But repeatability only increases, uh, cannot increase false acceptances. It can uh, lead to false rejections. But again, we can live with repeatability when we're validating the test method. We have to primary focus on bias and reproducibility. Now, this is going to be particularly important because we can't always look at repeatability. What if the test is destructive? We can look at reproducibility and we can look at bias, but we cannot estimate the repeatability of a destructive test. And we don't have to if we're using a variable sampling plan or an attribute sampling plan with an underlying measurement. We don't have to look at repeatability. Obviously, we can't do a gauge r and r study, so the question will be, what's the tool that you use in this case when you have a destructive test? Well, it's a operator or reproducibility study, and I'll talk about that when we get to the toolbox first, uh, or later. Uh, first of all, I want to focus on uh, the process that we go through, the procedure. So, full verification or 100% inspections is another one. Well, here we're measuring each part to see if it's in spec. And bias can cause us to take a part that's out of spec and measure it in and release it. Repro reproducibility issues can cause us to take a part that's out of spec and measure it in and release it. And repeatability can cause us to take a part that's out of spec and uh, 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 release it. So all three are concerned for full verification. For acceptance sampling, only the top two are concerned. All three are uh, important for full verification. So we have to be able to prove it's repeatable if we want to use it for full verification. Well, obviously, we can't use the destructive test for full verification or you couldn't release any product. So we can, in this case, look at repeatability when we're using it for 100% inspection. But for sampling plans, destructive test, we can still validate it and uh, for the use of intended at use of a sampling plan, even though we may not be able to validate it for the uh, use of a full verification. And so uh, bias causes us to take a unit that's out of spec and measure it in. A little bit above the upper spec limit, and it measures in. Uh, repeatability, reproducibility, units that are a little bit outside the specification limits could measure inside the specification limit, and we can make an error. Now, what happens if uh, you can't meet one of these requirements? Bias, repeatability, reproducibility. Does that mean you can't use the measurement instrument? Well, other types of validation, like a process validation, if it doesn't pass, we got to improve the process. We can't use it and go into production until we pass the process validation. But for a test method validation, if it fails one of the acceptance criteria, we can go ahead and improve it. That's always an option. But we also have the option of guard banding. So we take into account the bias, maximum bias. We take into uh, account the reproducibility between operators. And we take our spec limits and come in a distance far enough and only release units of product that are inside those limits, or use those as our altered specification limits for acceptance sampling. So we guard band the spec limits to protect against the measurement uh, variation we see in the gauge. So it's not a, a stop the everything, we have to fix the instrument before we can go into production if we fail one of the acceptance criteria for a gauge r and study, but it alters how we can use uh, the gauge. So here's a, a little bit of a chart that takes the three areas I've talked about so far, full verification, variable, and our attribute plan, and says if you fail the bias criteria, you need to guard band against the maximum bias. If you fail the repeatability for full verification, you need to guard band based on your repeatability. Do not have to take any further action for variable or attribute sampling plans. If you fail the reproducibility, then you need to guard band uh, for all three of the applications. So in some ways, reproducibility differences between the operators and a bias, a constant bias or whatever, don't, aren't treated any different from the point of view of their impact on a full verification. You can almost think as differences between operators as each shift, there's a different bias due to which operators on there and all the units in that shift are measuring so much off due to the change in, in the operator and so it's a bias that kind of changes over time. 
So reproducibility issues and bias issues basically have to be treated the same. Uh, repeatability only has to be addressed for full verification, which means testing is non-destructive if we're using it for full verification. And uh, so, factors leading to false decisions, uh, kind of, uh, I guess, th there's two more intended applications. One of them is statistical studies like the design of experiments. And so, factors that can lead to false decision, if we have re repeatability issues, if more noise in our data, it can cause us to miss an important uh, factor. So, oh, that's not significant. Uh, when really it is, it's just the noise, the variation hitting. Reproducibility, appraisers that are different. Well, if we have one appraiser do the measurements for the new material and another appraiser do the measurements for the old material, and then we compare them, the material difference we think we see might really be a difference between the two appraisers. So we can end up with confounded effects and biasing uh, due to the operators. Now, bias, if uh, there's a constant bias across everything, as we're doing comparisons, new materials to old materials, the bias doesn't matter. We're looking at the difference, not at the absolute numbers. And so uh, bias doesn't adversely affect a statistical study like this, uh, but repeatability and reproducibility do. Uh, now, however, as we're designing the study, we can take measures to fix both of these problems or guard against them so that we can go ahead and use an instrument that has poor repeatability, poor reproducibility, and a big bias and still run a designed experiment off of it to come up with what are the effects of the important measurements. Now, for repeatability, we just increase the sample size. Increase the sample size, you get better estimates. And so you can see through the noise with enough data. Uh, balanced design will eliminate the effects. So have half the measurements of the new material using one operator, the other half using the other operator, and then to do the same stuff with the old material. So there's equal number of samples from each of the two groups by each of the operators, cancels out the operator effect, and so we can just see the material effect independently of the operator. And so regardless here, uh, we can turn around and run the study and design the study. Now when there's huge operator effects and repeatability issues, the sample size can be large, the, the study design can be complicated, but we can still design the study for a statistical study. Another application of measurement devices is for control charting. And with control charting, when we're looking for a change in the process, uh, bias doesn't have an effect. If all the, all the values are biased by a certain amount, the change is still a change. We're looking for a change from the initial estimate to the L. Repeatability, well, that can hide the effect of something. Repeatability widens out our control limits, making it harder to detect something. But we can overcome that with sample size just like before. Reproducibility is a big issue because you go from shift to shift and operators change. Uh, that may shift your values on the control chart and cause the control chart to falsely signal an issue. So we really want to look at reproducibility issues uh, before we use a control chart online. I do remember a case of an extrusion process where every time the checker changed, uh, the operators have to adjust the machine uh, to account for the new checker. It was using a, a gauge to measure the inside diameter of the tubing and how hard you pushed on the gauge had an impact on what reading you got. And so shift changes, the operators always had to adjust their process. Poor reproducibility. And that uh, kind of negates using a control chart when you have those reproducibility issues. So bias is not a factor. Reproducibility is always a concern. Repeatability can be compensated by increasing sample size. So part of it, when you do fail one of the acceptance criteria for bias, repeatability, reproducibility, you always have to ask the question, do I want to take the uh, higher sample size, uh, risk a false uh, rejection, a good product, or do I want to improve my instrument? So I'm not saying that you don't, uh, that you don't have to improve your instrument it means you don't want to improve your instrument, you don't have to. A lot of times it's still the better action is to improve the instrument, get it to be better. Uh, but at the same time, that may delay you. And so you have an option for proceeding, uh, taking some of these other measurements. And so depending on its intended use, you must demonstrate the instrument has low bias, sampling plans, full verification, control charts around target. So if you're trying to demonstrate that you're on target or not, then bias does have an effect. If you're just using the control chart to detect a change, then bias doesn't have uh, an effect. 
Reproducibility, sampling plans, full verifications, control charts, all affected by reproducibility. And then repeatability, uh, full verifications are the primary tool uh, or situation where we have to be concerned with uh, uh, repeatability. Now, the tools. So once we've identified kind of what it is we have to do and when we have to look at bias and repeatability and reproducibility, uh, for bias, it's generally controlled by calibration. And we want to make sure that we have a calibration procedure in place such that the bias is acceptably small compared to the specification range. And so by one means or another, we want to show that the maximum bias is less than, say, 1 20th the width of the specification range. Obviously, we couldn't have the bias be less than one half the specification range, or it could cause a unit at the middle of spec to measure at the specification range. So a half is a totally unreasonable value. 120 is a, a value that is commonly uh, used. Now, so for, that's for bias. Gauge r and r study, repeatability and reproducibility, uh, looks at both reproducibility and repeatability, and we'd have to use it if we're doing 100% inspection. If we're 100% inspection, repeatability is important as well as reproducibility. So 100% inspection or full verification activity, we have to do a gauge R and R study. We have multiple operators, measure multiple parts, multiple times. It looks at repeatability and it looks at reproducibility. Uh, obviously we can't do a gauge R and R study on a destructive test because you can't measure the same part uh, more than once. It is required for full verification only. We don't need to do a gauge R and R study. Uh, if there's a using it for a sampling plan, we only have to demonstrate reproducibility. And again, that doesn't mean we can't do a gauge R and R study on something we're using for a sampling plan. Uh, it doesn't hurt to look at repeatability because it does have a business impact on our sampling plans. Uh, but in terms of a customer impact, uh, it doesn't. Now, acceptance criteria, uh, again, that the standard deviation of the gauge be less than 1 20th of the specification limit. Now, in doing gauge R&R studies, they often talk about total gauge R&R to percent tolerance. Uh, and uh, see the formula there for it, and basically that top criteria can be written as the bottom criteria with 30% as the acceptance criteria. So total gauge R&R, uh, that less than or equal to 30% corresponds to the measurement variation being less than 1 20th of the specification range. Consistent with the 1 20th for the bias as well. We allow some for the bias, we allow some for the measurement uh, variation. Now in our industry, as soon as you write that as an acceptance criteria, that gauge r and r study is now a sampling plan, has an acceptance criteria. And sampling plans per 82250B need to be, uh, have to have a procedure for selecting sampling plans to ensure that they're adequate for the intended use. So then we need a written document that we can hand to the FDA that says why 30% is the proper value to use here uh, for this. And when the FDA asks a question like that, what's your rationale for the sampling plan? They don't want to see our lips moving, they want to see our arm moving written for a piece of paper because half the regulations, the last statement is it shall be documented. It does say written procedure. Uh, there, 84 times in 820. So it's kind of clear they want it uh, written down. And so most books in gauge R&R, &R, now gauge R&R &R is a good tool, but again we have to adapt it to the real world. And some of the there uh, issues is one, uh, gauge R, classical gauge R&R &R study, they said we have this part and we're trying to demonstrate the instrument can measure that part. Well if I'm validating a coordinate measurement machine, I have hundreds of parts I'm going to measure with that and all sorts of dimensions on those parts that I want to do. And I don't want to do 200 gauge R and R studies, one for every dimension on every part. I want to do one gauge R and R study uh, across that. Uh, it treats operators as the only source of reproducibility. If you go into uh, Minitab, it doesn't even say reproducibility factor, it just says operators. Tell us where your operator variable is. Well, that can be de devices, that can be days. Uh, you can use all sorts of things there. Uh, you know, what do you do with the instrument that uh, you only push a button on and everything is automated? Uh, it doesn't make any sense to have operators as your factor there. We want to have other factors there besides operator. And then it doesn't discuss measurement range. So a very key part in our industry 
is that when we have an instrument, we have to talk about what is the precision and accuracy of it. We also have to say what is the measurement range that device has been validated to. So a coordinate measure machine, uh, maybe from a quarter inch up to five feet or something like that. You know, different machines, optical comparator, here's the smallest, largest dimension that we can have. We have to have a, a measurement range. And again, you don't see measurement range mentioned in uh, most gauge r and uh, books or courses. They just talk about a representative sample of the process. They could all be in the middle of the spec range. You might not even have a single unit outside of spec when you're going to use this device to measure and try to prove a unit's out of spec and try to detect units that are out of spec. It seems like you'd want to at least have it measure some units that are out of spec as part of the test method validation. So we'll talk about some modifications here to the standard gauge r and practices to accommodate the full range of practices. First of all, parts generally should not be representative of the manufacturing process. We're not trying to prove the process is good. We may not even have a manufacturing process at this point because we have to validate the test method uh, before we can use it for design verification. That's developing the product. And after we develop the product, we then may have to develop the process to produce the product. And so we may be a long ways away from having units of production. On a coordinate measurement machine, I have thousands of different parts that uh, be produced. New parts coming all the time that we're going to be measuring off the machine. We want to make sure that we talk about what is the measurement range that we can use it. And we have parts uh, that are across that range. And for that purposes, we design some special parts that we make just for the purposes of validation that have all the features on it at the extremes of what we want to validate the instrument for so we can demonstrate using these special parts that we can accurately measure over established range and then as new parts come in as long as they're within the range uh, then the test method has already been validated for them. And so parts represent of the measurement range it'd be nice to have some units even if it's just one dimension on one part that you're validating the test instrument for, it would still be nice to have some units that were above the lower spec, or the lower spec, or above the upper spec limit, below the lower spec limit, and uh, uh, across the range, not necessarily a representative sample of the manufacturing process. You'd also want to incorporate in those parts any difficulties you might have in measuring parts, such as if you're measuring a diameter, try to find some outer, outer round parts as well as some round parts in order to make sure that you can handle some of the complications. If you're measuring uh, optical comparator, make sure you get some that have kind of rounded corners as well as uh, perfectly ang straight right angle corners where it might be difficult focusing and, and finding and locating the right places uh, for taking the measurements. Now, so that's one consideration. Operators should be placed with whatever makes the most sense, whether that's setups of the instrument, days, uh, calibrations, or whatever. Uh, Sometimes we have multiple instruments we're trying to validate as a group. We have a group of 10 gauges. The reproducibility could be with respect to the gauges that are being used. And uh, you can have more than one reproducibility factor in there. Uh, Nini tab now has an option in it for a multi-factor uh, gauge r and study where you can have operators and days, instruments and operators, both in a study and demonstrate its reproducibility with respect to both of those. And finally, when a measurement device is used for multiple specifications, uh, what we might want to do is take that uh, ratio to tolerance of 30% and reverse it and say the acceptance criteria is 30%. 30%. What's the tightest specification limit that passes the 30 cent? Uh, and then we label the gauge. Here's the tightest tolerance that this gauge can be used for. If the tolerance is tighter than this, you've got to pick a different gauge. Now you have a range that your optical comparator can measure and the a range that a, a snap gauge can measure. You have a range that the coordinate measurement machine can measure. As you set a tolerance, you can then look up and say which instrument's going to have to be used to verify that that requirement is met. Is it in hundreds of an inch, thousands of an inch, ten thousandths of an inch? That'll determine what gauge gets selected in order to, to measure it. So just reverse the equation and say 30% acceptance, what's the tightest specification range that I can use the instrument for? Now, with respect to reproducibility, uh, uh, here I'm going to talk about a reproducibility study that does not look at repeatability. It just looks at reproducibility. 
because obviously a gauge R and R study cannot be performed on a destructive test. And so we have to uh, just look at reproducibility. So the way a reproducibility study works is we have multiple operators measure, and they can't measure the same part, so what we have to do is get a pool of parts that are as close together as we can and then randomly assign them to the operators. And we're not interested in the uh, measurement to measurement variation within an operator because it's a combination of part and repeatability and we can't separate the two. But we can still look at the differences between the operators. And so basically this is what in statistics we call an analysis of variance for operators or whatever else we want to have as a factor and we can see what percentage of the uh, range. We'll get a standard deviation for the operators just like before. So we have a standard deviation for repeatability. Uh, and then we compare and make sure that that measurement reproducibility, the standard deviation between the operators is less than 20% uh, of the specification range. Looks like I pulled the wrong formula there. That should be upper spec limit minus uh, lower spec limit uh, there. But it's uh, the same criteria as before, less than 20% of the spec range. We want bias to be small. We want repeatability to be small. We want reproducibility to be small uh, relative to the specification range. Now, reproducibility study can be used when we're just using a sampling plan. It can be done even though the testing is destructive. Uh, now, what if testing is, uh, we're using a sampling plan and testing is non-destructive? We can do a reproducibility study, but I would probably say better to do a gauge r and study. If testing's not destructive, get reproducibility and repeatability, because repeatability is still a concern to us, even for a sampling plan, from a business perspective. Not necessarily, though, from a regulatory and a customer perspective. We're taking the, the risk with a false rejections of good product. So non-destructive, do a gauge r and study. Uh, destructive testing, repeatability is very important still. Uh, and so we can just do a reproducibility study on the operators. And then last, uh, what if it's not a measurement at all, but you get a pass-fail result? How do you validate an inspection method that's uh, pass-fail? Well, there's two errors you can make. Pass a bad unit, accept a good unit. Now, or, or, sorry, reject a good unit. Uh, that's a business concern, that second one. The first one, pass a bad unit, is a regulatory concern or a customer. There are times we greatly slant the inspection to make sure we don't make the top error and we're willing to take the risk of the bottom error. And so again, it's a business decision, that second one. And I'll give you an example. Making IV bags or uh, vials, and we're looking for visible particulate in that. We don't want any visible particulate. A single bottle with a, vi a visible particulate in it in the marketplace will cause the immediate recall of the entire lot of material. Uh, so, we take each bottle, we put it on an uh, inspection, it spins the bottle, stops it suddenly, and looks for motion in the bottle. If there's something spinning around in the bottle, then it rejects it. Now, sometimes that's a particle, and sometimes it's a bubble. But we're willing to throw out 100 units with bubbles in them to make sure that one unit with particle doesn't you know, get out the door. And so, we're willing to take a big risk on that second one to make sure that the first one never occurs. And so uh, we only, and what I'm going to suggest here in this study, is we only put the acceptance criteria on the first of these two, a pass a bad unit, and show that, that we, our chances of missing a bad unit is acceptably small. Now, as we run these studies, it's not like we ignore the other one. We collect the data, and we estimate it, and we make a business decision whether the gauge is working good enough or not. But from our protocol, we only have an acceptance criteria relative to passing a, a bad unit. That's the one that would prohibit us from using the inspection uh, in order to release product. And so we want to prove the probability of passing a bad unit is low. So we have to decide, first of all, in a confidence statement. Uh, like 95% confidence, the probability of detecting a bad unit exceeds uh, 95%. So 95% confidence, more than 95% of bad units are detected. Now, you have to get a little bit used to these confidence statements because it's not saying it's okay to miss 5% of bad units. In this uh, sampling plan that we're going to pick here, 
If you missed 5% of bad units, you have a 95% chance of failing. So that 95% is an intolerable level. The sampling plan is almost certain to fail. And so these are unacceptable levels. So we pick a sampling plan that allows us to make this confidence statement. And one such plan is to take 60 samples and accept on zero. You take 60 samples, no defects, then you can say with 95% confidence, more than 95% conforming, or in this case, conformance is detecting a bad unit. Now we have to adapt this a little bit. Does that mean we test 30 unit, 60 units of product and see if we missed any? Well, no, we have to test 60 bad units, 60 inspections of bad units. And then if there's no misses, we pass. So does that mean we have to have 60 bad units? Not necessarily. We could have six bad units and then inspect them 10 times each. So we might have six bad units and 10 operators to perform 60 inspections of of bad units, and if there's no misses, then we can make our desired confidence statement. And so 60 inspections of bad units, no bad units, uh, all bad units are detected, then we pass, we can make the confidence statement. Now, all statistical procedures have assumptions. Sampling plans have an assumption of a representative sample. So we need to make sure in this case that the testing is done under representative conditions. You can't just give an inspector six bad units and say, are these all bad? You gotta bury those bad units in among a whole bunch of good units and make them work for it. And so, uh, so it's, it's six bad units and, and maybe uh, we have another 20 good units, we mix them up and present them to inspector, make sure they get the six bad units and uh, do that, 10 different inspectors. So 60 inspections of bad units but in among hundreds of inspections of units of product to make sure they don't miss any of the, the bad units. And also, the bad units have to be representative of actual bad units found in production. If you're training an operator to do an inspection for visible particulate, you can't put golf balls in the vials. Uh, easy to detect. You have to get calibrated 100 micron particles with the right surface finish and everything. You can buy them. Uh, calibrated particles to put in the bottles to make sure the inspectors can, can catch those and demonstrate that they consistently do the job. So 60 bad units is part of a uh, larger pool of inspections and inspections performed under representative conditions. They don't get extra time, they don't get better lighting. It has to really be done uh, under representative conditions, which means it's best done if the operators are blinded to the fact that they're even doing a study. And so units are fed in and uh, they're tested. And so here's a table that tells some different sampling plans uh, that give 95% confidence. So the first group under critical risk, 95% confidence of more than 95% conformance, 59 except on zero is the first plan up there. Basically that's the 60 except on zero plan I was just talking about. There's some double sampling plans there as well. Uh, the point that I wanna make about all these plans that if you have 5% that you're missing, you're gonna fail the plan. So how good do you have to be in order to pass the plan? That's these numbers over here. You have to be able to catch 99.1%. Here you have to catch 99.9%. .9%. That's one in a thousand units of product. That if you uh, can't do that, you're gonna run a risk of failing the validation. Now you're guaranteed of failing the validation if you're up at this level. But as soon as you go above these levels, you start to run a risk of failing. And it's for that reason that this number may not sound very stringent at first, but you'll find out it's actually pretty difficult to pass these types of validations unless you have a really good uh, test method. And we do base things on risk, uh, life and safety related thing versus a functional related versus a cosmetic related thing here. We have different levels of conformance that we uh, associate with our sampling plans. And so, We'll usually have a table like this that says, based on the risk level of that, what sort of confidence statement do you need to make and for a test method validation. This is for a process validation, design verification. Remember, 820.250 says, uh, for sampling plans, you need to have a procedure for selecting sampling plans to ensure that they're adequate for their intended use. And so that means based on the risk, and it also means based on whether you're using a sampling plan 100% inspection, and so on, is part of your uh, procedure. So basic summary, uh, in my procedure for test method validations, 
uh, it starts off here, is it a compendium or self-evident test? If you do that, really what you have to do is train in using the compendial method, we're using a standard, and then demonstrate competency that the operators are performing the test uh, correctly. We don't have to go into our full test method validation. Continuous measurement or a pass-fail result? If it's continuous, is testing destructive? Yes, then a reproducibility study. Evaluate bias and reproducibility. If testing is non-destructive, evaluate bias and perform a gauge R&R study. And then if you pass all the acceptance criteria, you can use it. If not, determine if guard banding is required. And on the other side of it, pass-fail, perform a validation of a pass-fail test using those sampling plans I just uh, looked at. And if you meet the pass-fail acceptance criteria, then you can go ahead and use it for full verifications and so on. If you fail that, there is still one allowed application of the test method, and that's for performing 100% inspection, but when it's not considered for re final release of the product. So you would have sampling plans or other controls after it. You know, if you have a procedure that only catches half the bad units, we can't say that we're using a validated test method and 100% inspection is catching uh, all the bad units, but it still catches half the bad units, so why wouldn't we want to do that anyways if, if we can pull out some of the bad units uh, by performing an inspection, especially if it's cheap enough. And so uh, that's the, the overall uh, procedure. And so one of the things about writing a procedure, again, you have to write the procedure to cover everything, not just the primary tool that's used. For gauge R&R, &R, we still have to deal with the real world uh, applications of measurement range, multiple parts being measured by the same thing. And so you see with the procedure, we, we handle these types of complexities. So this Monday, I released a, a new book titled Statistical Procedures for the Medical Device Industry. Got a copy of it up here. You can see it's quite thick. 19 procedures and test method validation is one of those. Uh, there's ones for uh, trending of quality data, for validation sampling plans, for verification sampling plans, uh, uh, all the different elements of uh, the quality system where statistics uh, ap applies. Are those new procedures you say? Uh, these are my most recent versions of the procedures, yeah. Uh, so so they're, they're not required to be used, uh, but the company is required to have procedures. So, so this, yeah. No, no, the, the have procedures, no. Uh, that, that requirement from the, the uh, 820 is 25 years old or so, yeah. So, now, the FDA's enforcement is certainly a moving target and a validation that we might have performed or a test method validation we might have performed 20 years ago and it was okay, may not be okay by today's standard. The regulations haven't changed, but certainly uh, we've been pushed to improve as we go through that. So, uh, so that's the, the reference uh, to the book there. Uh, any questions or comments? Okay, we'll get a mic to you. It's being taped and broadcast, so we want to make sure you speak into the mic. Uh, yeah, right here, the lady has one. Hi, thank you yeah. for your talk. Um, I had a question regarding what you would consider destructive tests. So um, in my laboratory, we do a lot of, uh, we'll make a standard and run that with many of our runs to make sure that things are looking right. So if I wanted to perform a study, if I made a big batch of standard and then each operator was um, aliquoting it into a vial to measure, is that considered a destructive test because each individual one is being used and can't be reused or? Well, you could consider it to be a non-destructive test for the purpose of doing a gauge r, &R study. If you can mix that, mix that solution homogeneous to start with and then break it out into different aliquots. And so it may even be like a pharmaceutical tablet. And the assay normally requires a tablet in order to do the assay. But you take 20 tablets, you grind them up, you mix them, and then you break them into aliquots. And then you can use that as a non-destructive test doing the chemical assay. So <laughs> and then regarding uh, if you're looking at operator variation, them aliquoting that is part of the variation as well that you're looking at. So I guess that just goes into the kind of multiple components of it that you were talking about. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so if the operator is part of the test method to <coughs> split the aliquot or get, uh, split it into three aliquots, perform a test in each one, and then potentially average the three together to get the assay result, uh, you would consider all that to be part of the process variation. But you need to have, if they need three aliquots to do the assay, then you'd need to have like 30 aliquots worth of solution or powder mixed thoroughly so you could break that into 10 triple aliquots that you could then give to the different operators to measure and then do their measurement. So you have to define where's the measurement and, and if splitting it into aliquots, measuring out a quantity is an important step in the accuracy of the assay, then yeah, that's something you want to have the operators doing exactly representative of how they would do the testing in, in the laboratory. Uh, there are sometimes limits to how many times you can test a unit. It may not be uh, totally destructive, but you take an example of an earpiece that uh, you put on, to, uh, one of my customers makes this, it's for a hearing test. So you put this uh, pad over the ear of a newborn and they put different sounds into it and then they measure brainstem activity so they can detect on a, a baby that's just a few hours old whether they're deaf or not. And so. Uh, you take this cap off, removal force of the cap, and uh, you know, once, twice, three times, it's pretty much the same removal force. 20 times, it won't stick anymore. So you may have to do uh, no more than five tests on a unit and factor that into the design of your study. Okay, other, okay? Uh, great presentation, Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Um, I've been in this area before and, when, and started from the ground up and picking sampling plans of, with engineering, obviously. They mm -hmm. made the decisions. Um, my question to you really is, and by the way, FDA absolutely requires a procedure <laughs> on selection of sampling plans. I've uh, been in this industry for 15 years, so I back you up there all. all, all. <laughs> my question is, is over time when you're looking at defect data, when we were talking earlier, mm -hmm. um, in your book, do you discuss changing AQLs when AQLs are meeting the needs? In other words, uh, less, less okay. tightened inspections. Well, relative to manufacturing sampling plans, the AQLs are generally selected based on the severity of the characteristic and do not change over time. But the sampling plan will change over time based on whether you have good history or bad history by changing the RQL or LTPD of the sampling plan. So you bring it in tight to the AQL or you have it quite a bit away. So the sample size and the regulations, 82250B, require that sampling plans be re periodically reviewed. And so what can change? Well, the severity of the defect doesn't change. So what changes is your manufacturing experience. Have we run into problems? Has the process run well? Uh, and uh, those are the things that can change and we would adjust our sampling plan. But generally, same AQL different RQL or LTPD based on your history. Any other questions? Okay, I think the Wayne did a very good job at <laughs> systematically explaining the test method validation process and how we can do it. Thank you, Wayne, for really going through the process. Yes. And let's give a round of applause to Wayne. <laughs> Thank you very much. Excellent, Wayne. Yeah, thank you.